Longworth and welcome to a special edition of Try It Today. Over the next half hour, we'll be speaking with Congresspersons Kathy Manning and Ted Budd about a wide range of issues and public policy initiatives that affect all of us. But before we get started with that conversation, here are a few remarks from my good friend Todd Hall, the president and CEO of True Light Federal Credit Union, who's helping to sponsor this program. In this heightened political climate, it's especially important to find resources that separate the noise from the news a resource that focuses on what's going on in our government and how current and proposed initiatives might impact our community. That's why True Lion Federal Credit Union supports Triad today and its commitment to voter education. I'm Todd Hall, President and CEO of True Lion, and we hope you enjoy this special report from Congress. Thanks, Todd. And now to the introductions on my immediate right. You've seen her before in the program. Kathy Manning is an attorney from Greensboro. She's in her first term representing the 6th District. Uh, which uh, covers, of course, all of Guilford County, part of Forsyth, encompasses all the Tri-Cities, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and High Point, and uh, socially distanced and sort of back uh, behind us here in the center, Ted Budd, a businessman from Advance. He's in his third term representing the 13th District, and let me rattle off these names as you look at the map. Alamance, Caswell, Chatham, Davidson, Davy, Lee, Person, Randolph, Rowan, and part of Iredell. And as a disclaimer, let me just remind everybody, we are taping on Wednesday, June the 2nd, because this is when we can get these two fine folks here in their break before they go back to the hard work of being congresspersons. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much. Let's start out with uh, talking about COVID and the economy and link those together. Thanks to stimulus checks, extended moratoriums on uh, when you can evict somebody, uh, bonuses and unemployment and this and that. Um, millions of people uh, are now saying, I'm not ready to return to work, although there are job openings there. I guess my question to you all first is, did the government offer too much pandemic relief, just enough pandemic relief, or not enough, Kathy? I think it's important for us to remember where we were in January. When I first got to Congress, uh, we couldn't have been sitting here in this room today un with no masks on, even though we were socially distanced. Right. We were in a situation where we had had almost half a million deaths in the country from COVID. Uh, we were. Uh, we had just gotten a vaccine developed, but we had no plan by the prior administration to get that vaccine and get shots in arms. So I was so proud to be able to, to work for and vote for the American Rescue Plan. And with that plan, we have been so successful in that vaccine rollout. We have gotten shots in arms. Right. We have gotten money uh, to people who were not able to buy food, so people are not going hungry. And it helped a lot, it helped a lot of people. It helped but, a I mean, lot Ted of people. And, and just let, let's not forget, not only did we have small businesses struggling, and we are in a venue right here that I was talking to the owners, and they, were t they told us they were able to get money from both PPP loans. They were able to get the idle loans. I mean, that American Rescue Plan helped so many people. people. And we still don't have child care open. We still don't have schools open. That's all in the future. Ted. Yeah, I would say early on, again, uh, we, we joined uh, together. I mean, you, were, you joined in um, January, correct, I think, Kathy. So before that, before, during the Trump administration in the last Congress, I think it started out being just enough. Um, but then it became more and more and more. And later on, we saw packages, particularly under the Biden administration, that would, uh, like the American Rescue Plan, ostensibly to help with COVID, but only 10% of it actually dealt with COVID. Even a smaller fraction actually dealt with vaccines. But I would thank the prior administration, the Trump administration, for what they did in regards to uh, Operation Warp Speed. That's been continued by the current administration. We're having a very successful, um, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, a very successful vaccine rollout. So um, I think that's helped. But I would say right now it was, uh, you know, we needed, yeah, it's debatable what you think about the shutdown, um, but since you did, we had to help a lot of businesses. Right now, we need to get people back into the workforce. And we're, if, if they'll go. If they'll go. There's an, there's a, unfortunately, there's a stay at home incentive right now. Uh, I've got a bill that I'm working on federally, and I'm encouraging those at the state level with this, uh, a similar uh, bill to make sure that people get back into the workforce. Mine federally is the Back to Work Bonus Act. That's the $900 thing. That's right. But it's already appropriated money. It's money that's already been spent, so it doesn't cost anything to the taxpayer. Okay, sort of connected to what we're talking about very quickly, Kathy, the Debt Collection Improvement Act. Both of you voted on it. Kathy, you voted for it. Ted voted against. Quickly, why? I think that bill is, was incredibly important to stop abusive practices 
that uh, debt collectors were using on students, on small businesses, and on members of the military. Some of the abusive practices are so outrageous, harassing people with endless phone calls, emails, letters, lying to people. In fact, one of the practices we have seen that's, that is stopped by this bill is lying to service members and members of service members' families, telling them that they would have a rank reduction if they did not pay their debts. This bill will stop that. A little less than a minute, Ted. Yeah, again, we're against all of those types of practices that uh, my colleague just mentioned. But when it's debt reduction, I mean, the Improvement Act, that's a great name. But unfortunately, when a small business, a mom and pop business actually loans money in a free economy, that business actually depends to re receive those receivables. And so when you tell a mom and pop businesses that they can lend money on credit to someone but can't get it back, that actually hurts that small business. So yeah, there's two sides to everything. And I have to I have to say that's something that I thought about too because I think I read 90% of those who own rental properties were mom and pop folks that depended on Absolutely. that income and they couldn't yeah. get it. It's a tough thing. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, I wanna talk about the serious problem of guns and violence. We'll be right back. Back now on our special edition of Try Today, our report from Congress with uh, Congresspersons Kathy Manning and Ted Bond, who have uh, uh, agreed to come here, and I thank them for their time. Thanks for being here today. Um, let's talk about guns and violence. Uh, last year, there were 600, by my count, 612 mass shootings in the United States. We've had over 200 so far in this calendar year, and we're taping on June the 2nd. Um, Congress still hasn't passed what I would term as a comprehensive package to curb gun violence. What's holding it up, Kathy? Look, I was thrilled to be able to vote for two uh, gun safety bills that have passed the House. The first one uh, would put in place universal background checks, and that is something that's supported by, uh, I believe, more than 90 percent of Americans. Everyone should pass a background check before they get a lethal weapon. The second bill would close that Charleston loophole. As you know, the way things stand right now, if your background check is not passed within three days, the default is you get the gun. That's backwards. It should be you don't get the gun until you pass the background check. And if that bill had been in place uh, when, when that Charleston shooter slaughtered nine people at Bible study, those people would be alive today. Now, I'm not defending what you're about to say, and and, and in full so disclosure, you know. <laughs> no, it's full disclosure, uh, uh, Ted has a, a owner of a, of a gun range, very fine operation and very safely operated. But here's the thing, Kathy and Ted, there are more guns in existence uh, than there are people in the United States. So, I mean, it's almost, you feel almost defeated no matter what we can work on, whether it's background check. And I'm not saying that you're wrong, I agree with you totally. But there's so many out there already. I don't know, what's the answer, Ted? So I would say, look, every tragedy that you referred to, uh, and when you look at mass violence, um, a lot of times that's a domestic dispute because it's three or more, and all those are tragic. The larger ones uh, are absolutely tragic. We want all of our neighbors, we want our loved ones, especially our children, we want them to come home safely without threats like we're referring to here. What we wanna do, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, is we wanna keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous individuals. If that's somebody with terrorist intent, criminal intent, and right now, especially what we're dealing with is mental illness. Mentally disturbed people. Absolutely. If you look at ATF Form 4473, that's the form that you fill out when you purchase a firearm commercially. Uh, we need to have very stiff penalties on those that, that violate that and lie on that form. Yeah, but I tell you what, Ted, I, you know, some of the parents and folks, I don't mean to be harsh about this, but people know that they have someone in their household who's not right, you know, and, and they don't say anything. Students don't say anything. Maybe there's an area we can work on too. Before they we, should, I, I would just want to say on your show, they should absolutely call law enforcement if that's the case and they feel threatened. I want to talk about the January insurrection uh, just for a second, not to rehash the whole thing, but the uh, bipartisan commission was voted on and passed by all the House Democrats and 39 Republicans. Ted was not one of them. Ted, I'm going to ask Kathy why it's an important commission that should have been passed. Ted, I'm going to start with you though. Why did you vote against it? Because it seems like no matter who you are and what party, you'd want to know how we can prevent it from happening again. Well, I would agree with that part, and I would agree that it's a, it was a very difficult day, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on. Uh, but I would say it's already being investigated by the FBI, by the Department of Justice. It's being uh, by local. You have a, a Washington police authority there. So there's already investigations going on. What we want to do is depoliticize it. We, want to, we don't need a politicized commission that puts it in, makes it a public spectacle. But we had a 9-11 commission. And you can also investigate it 
Uh, you can also, look, there were 3,000 people killed that day in an ongoing terrorist threat on that, and the one you referred to. This is very different, and it's already being investigated, and you can investigate it in congressional committees. One minute left. <clears throat> Kathy, tell me. I was in the House gallery that day. I was in the last group brought out to safety. I was sitting in that uh, gallery with people pounding on the doors to get into us. We have a right to know what happened, and the the commission that we voted on was a bipartisan commission that was designed by an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. It was a bipartisan bill. Of course we voted in favor of it. We, we want to know the truth. We want to know what happened, how it got to that point, and how we can solve it in the future. Yeah, I was worried about you that day. I emailed you that day. I, I was worried about you there and all the folks that were in there. I don't know. Maybe Biden is going to do an executive commission study. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But when we come up uh, in the next segment, we'll talk about race relations and law enforcement. We'll touch on those two things. We'll be right back. Special edition uh, of Try Today, a report from Congress with uh, Kathy Manning and Ted Budd. Uh, let's talk about race relations and law enforcement for a couple minutes. Uh, what is Congress doing to reform law enforcement, Kathy? We've seen horrendous things happen, uh, attacks by law enforcement, uh, particularly on minority people, and the the, the, the murder of George Floyd was particularly heinous. And that's why I was so pleased to vote for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And that act would uh, ban uh, some of the atrocities like chokeholds, uh, no-knock warrants. It would create a national database so that police officers who engage in abusive practices where, where their information was entered into the database so that you couldn't have a police officer fired for abusive practices in one jurisdiction and then hired by another jurisdiction who didn't know. Which is happening all the time. It happened just recently. I don't want to go into the details, but it had to do with a Winston-Salem officer who left and went somewhere else and now is in hot water. Ted? Yeah, no doubt it's been a very tough year. Uh, prior to this, I was able to travel out with, bipartisan uh, with a member in Congress uh, to visit Ferguson and to see the devastation there. And then we see in various ways, a very similar thing happening in our country last summer, uh, starting with the, the tragic death of George Floyd. But I would want to support things like the Community Policing Act and make sure that we invest in our police. We should never defund our police. What that does, when you take resources away from the police, you spread the same amount of enforcement over more people, right, creating more right. stress and degrading the quality of their decisions. Yeah, that's not a solution. Yeah, I think it's a horrible solution, and I, I'm, I, it's shameful that those would support it. Right now, only 20 states require that a police officer's disciplinary file be made public. Should all 50 states have that? Quickly, Kathy. That's why I voted for the Justice and Policing Act, because it would create that national database. It did. Absolutely not. We, wouldn't, we shouldn't second-guess our officers, but it should be handled internally and with the municipality. Um, you know, some members of Congress uh, support uh, enacting a federal reparations program to compensate folks for slavery way after the fact, of course. Um, quickly, thoughts, Kathy? I have supported creating a study to, to study what reparations might look like and how we might, uh, might repair the, the wrongs of the past. Ted. I would say no, but we need to make sure that there's equality of opportunity and make sure everybody's got a shot at the great opportunity that this nation affords. You know, this building renaming thing that we're going through, well, Wake Forest has went through, a, it's going through this thing about, you know, folks who were a president of a university or ran a company and they were racist or they had slaves or they sold slaves. Um, you know, there, there have been criticisms leveled at Congress saying, okay, well, look, if you're going to make me take down this statue of Robert E. Lee, what about the Washington and Jefferson things? And well, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but is Congress even considering trying to, to equalize that situation? You know, several years ago, UNCG confronted that, and I was on the board at the time. UNCG put together a great process. On ACOC. Uh, yeah, exactly. They had a study. They brought in people who to explain the history. They had uh, opportunities for people to speak. They engaged all the stakeholders, and then they made a well-informed decision. I think the most important thing is that you have an appropriate process to discuss these things and use them as learning opportunities. Ted. I think we need to focus on the future, and uh, we need to be grateful for our founding fathers. Nobody's claiming perfection, but we need to lock arms across race, uh, across ethnicities, and let's work together as a country. And you know, as my friend Keith Granberry said on this show many times before, if you want to leave the old statues up, that's fine, but let's try to put some statues and monuments up 
to African American folks and Native American folks who have made great strides and accomplishments, and we don't have too many of those. Uh, well, when we come back, I want to talk about voter suppression for a few minutes, so I hope you'll stay with us. We'll be right back. Special edition as we hear from Kathy Manning and Ted Budd on our report from Congress, and we appreciate their time to do this. Uh, let's talk about voter suppression for just a moment. Uh, an increasing number of states are, as you know, I think it's uh, you know already what uh, Florida and Texas and others, Georgia, trying to enact uh, reforms that are reducing things like uh, eliminating the ballot drop boxes, reducing number of early voting days, deciding who can apply uh, for uh, mail-in ballots. Do you believe that these measures constitute voter suppression and should Congress make these types of measures illegal, Kathy? I was one of the early supporters of H.R. 1, the For the People Act, and that is a bill that would protect voting rights. It would um, make sure that there's early voting, it would make registration easier, it would make sure we have uh, mail-in voting and ballot boxes available, it would um, uh, do away with voter suppression, uh, it would do away with, it would protect us against foreign interference with our elections. We need, we had a record turnout of voters in a pandemic. So many of the things that allowed voters to vote with the, with the mail-in voting, ballot boxes, we need to protect those, and early voting, of course. Yeah. I think what we need to do is make it very easy for people to vote, but very hard to cheat. So that's the lens that you have to evaluate all these with. Um, voter suppression is a politicized term. Uh, you're going to convince people, uh, if you don't like me, not to turn out for me, or to turn out for me and not for my opponent. So I, look, that's not voter suppression, that's just politics. But we have to make sure that everyone, regardless of where they are, what neighborhood they're from, where they look like, that it's easy for them to vote, but hard to cheat. Because the real question now is, do we trust our institutions? And people are asking that question on both sides of the aisle. We wanna make sure, regardless of where you stand politically, but these are institutions that you can trust. I do not like HR1. I think it takes the chaos of 2020 and makes it into permanent law. And I, I think it's a for the politicians rather than a for the people act. Wait a minute, you said chaos. So the chaos of 2020 was the fact that, that Trump was lying about everything. I mean, what, what, what are you talking about? What chaos? But are you teaming up now? <laughs> well, no, but I'm just, I've jumped on Kathy before about Actually, stuff. I'm I just, think it, it was remarkable how many people got out to vote in a pandemic. Well, I shouldn't have said that. I, I, this show is not about the show is not about me. It's uh, they could do it without me. We're having fun here. Um, look, I, I'll tell you one thing I, that you and I probably do agree on, Ted. Though I, I had a problem with a couple of states. I think it was Pennsylvania, North Carolina, letting seven, eight, nine days go by before they even counted the mail-in ballots. I thought that was wrong. And people say, well, we don't want local interference, but. You've got, you're talking about federal elections, presidents, senators, congressmen. Shouldn't it, Kathy, don't you think that we should at least have a federal standard for when the mail-in ballots have to be counted by? I think we can learn from what worked and what didn't work in the last election. One of the problems we had in the last election was mail delivery. We know that we have problems oh, yes. with getting Louis, uh, the, Louis DeJoy is bringing you this program. Uh, let me just say, we still got Christmas cards in February. So uh, assuming we get our mail delivery back on track, we can learn from what, what worked and what didn't work. But the goal needs to be to make it easy for people to vote and allow as many people to vote as possible. There were 60 lawsuits thrown out of court because there was not sufficient evidence of voter fraud in right. this election. So we know we have free and fair elections. Let's let's let people vote. But these mail-in ballots that were counted eight, nine days afterwards, I didn't like that. You know, I don't either. I think we need to have a national known ahead of time deadline that says it needs to be in by election day. Plus we need to make sure that every state has voter ID. Even to get the, the basics of things in life, everyone has to have an ID. With the most important right that we have as, a, as, uh, as citizens, the right to vote, I think we should have an ID for that required. The 2020 census, which is going to cause a whole lot of mess in trying to redistrict things, uh, but maybe a good mess. Um, we don't know where the new 14th district is going to lie, but uh, very quickly, guys and gals, uh, do we need a bipartisan, truly bipartisan commission to figure out where these new lines are going to be drawn? I believe we do. I believe that we want voters to choose their representatives. We don't want representatives to choose their voters. Yeah, was she looking at you? <laughs> Perhaps so. Look, voters yeah. do choose their representatives in regards to those who, for us, go to Raleigh. They're state representatives. According to the U.S. Constitution, it's the state legislatures that draw the lines. And I think that should continue. Uh, they should stop the activist courts from influencing these. And just let the state legislatures draw it. If the people don't like that, they can elect new legislators. Yeah, we don't know exactly where this 14th district is going to be carved out. 
uh, but will the two of you email me if you decide to move to Raleigh or Charlotte? To, <laughs> I'm no, not going anywhere. No, no, she's not, not going, a chance. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> All right, when we come back, we'll have closing remarks. I'm gonna see uh, what's on tap, anything they, the two of them might be working on, and uh, we'll be right back. Back now as we start to wrap up this special report from Congress with Kathy Manning and Ted Budd, very quickly there was a student mental health bill that uh, came up. Um, the two of you, I think, voted for that. Both of you voted for that. Tell me bipartisan effort there. When people say we don't do anything bipartisan, yeah. they're not paying attention. That's right. We, we've seen the impact of this pandemic and the isolation on students all across the country, and the mental health impact has been devastating. And we need to do whatever we can to help people through this very tough time. Ted. On that, Kathy and I absolutely agree. We have to help our students. It's been tough, especially on uh, the very old and the very young in this, uh, in this last 15, 16 months. We need to give them the resources to get them the help okay. they need. Yeah. Uh, now, there have been uh, uh, some suggestions by some folks that we need to add four justices to the Supreme Court, try to counteract the conservative nature of the court, although I don't know if that would fix anything. Very, very quickly, up or down on this, what do you want to do? Historically, the Supreme Court has been a trusted institution. Uh, it's become more politicized. We need to, uh, the president has proposed a study of the Supreme Court to look at what we can do to make sure that the court remains a trusted institution. I think that study is appropriate. Good. I think the study is purely for political cover, and I think we need to leave it at nine. We need to have, uh, uh, we need to have a constitutional amendment that leaves it at nine. Um, and I think we need to leave the idea of court packing on the ash heap of history where FDR left it. Well, speaking of, uh, of uh, new legislation or potential legislation, we have a couple minutes left. Kathy, anything you want to plug or mention? Three things I'm working on. There are many things I'm working on, but I'll talk about three. Uh, one, I have introduced a bill to conduct greater oversight of for-profit colleges that are converting to nonprofit. We've seen a lot of problems there. Okay. We don't want that to hurt students. Uh, I have an amendment in HR1 that, that was accepted um, to make sure that we study why wait, why wait times are so long in certain areas because people don't want to wait more than 30 minutes to vote. Right. Last thing, uh, early on, I sent a letter with uh, Senator Sherrod Brown to uh, President Biden asking him to buy American, particularly for PPEs, because we have good PPE manufacturers in this area. And uh, shortly after we sent him that letter, he uh, issued an executive order along those lines. Good job on that. Ted, what are you uh, up to? Well, compliments to Kathy on the American supply chain, especially in regards to PPE. That's a national security issue. Uh, I've led uh, uh, with uh, Sherrod Brown's uh, colleague, Rod Portman, have uh, led legislation on that in making PPE in America. Um, also want to focus on the Back to Work Bonus Act that we referred to earlier. That takes the $900, which is three weeks of enhanced unemployment benefits, and actually puts that on a back to work bonus. Again, it's not an additional cost to the taxpayer. That money has already been appropriated. We want to take that, and uh, when people come to work for a period of time, we want to give them that. So it's a, it's a time-limited bill. Uh, our state legislatures, those in Raleigh, are actually working on something similar, uh, led by Senator Chuck Edwards. And I uh, just want to compliment on them on their efforts. Again, yeah, that's the being in the Republican minority is a little tougher to do things in Washington right now. Uh, but I would also say um, for the state, they have a good shot at this. Yeah. Well, Trump says he'll be back in August. So you know, who knows what will happen? Uh, we didn't rehearse this or anything. But Kathy, very quickly, uh, what's the toughest thing about being in Congress? There's a you're, lot. You're a there's, a, there's a lot of walking. Uh, we are walking back and forth to do our votes, and and the high heels are gone because you don't we, have that we, trouble. We, we <laughs> are, were, you know, they've never been. They, yeah. they they told me comfortable shoes, but I had no idea how much walking we would do in Congress. But I don't miss any votes, so I make sure I get those walks. Now, in. see if you'd been in the same party together, you'd have warned her about that. What's the what's the toughest? <laughs> oh, I would have helped her anyway, but yeah. didn't know about the high heels. What's the toughest thing for you? I would say you've got um, you've got a big district that I serve. It's ten counties now, and uh, I would say you're making sure that people have what they need, especially in the last 16 months. It's been a little different. Things like rural broadband, those are things we've really emphasized. All right, up on screen, I don't want to forget this. Uh, Manning.house.gov, if you want to find out what Kathy's up to and what she's working on, Manning.house.gov, and also Bud.house.gov, that is Bud.house.gov, and a final shout out and thanks, many thanks, Todd Hall and Attica Simpson, all the good folks at True Lion. TrueLionFCU.org is their website, TrueLionFCU.org, for all their help in putting this together. 
Kathy and Ted, thank you for taking time to do this and, and thanks for your service. Always thank a you pleasure. Thank you, Kathy. We'll be back next week.